Meta Modern Era by Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi. Read by Sukanil. Chapter 4 Racism. Racism, the greatest curse of human beings, has been created by man himself. God Almighty filled this world with different varieties and colors to create interest and beauty, but these varieties are only skin deep. It is said that a long time ago some prolific writers from Britain wrote horrible things against African blacks, and all this was so totally accepted that the people who called themselves white-skinned went all out to wipe out people who had some other color on their skin. For example, Columbus sailed to America by mistake, and the Spanish started expanding their own kingdom, and most of the Indians were wiped out from their own country. Of course, some of them disappeared into the high mountains and saved themselves. It is difficult to understand why these people landed in a country which belonged to somebody else. It was initially a venture to discover new lands, but these invaders then began to believe that this land was their own property. They thought it was their fundamental right to hate or kill people who had dark skin, or skin which was not like theirs, and to rob their lands forever. The diversity of bodies, facial features and skin colour created by nature is very important because otherwise everybody would look the same. The world would be inhabited by a regiment of boring human faces. Unfortunately, the coloured people were considered primitive, while the white-skinned were regarded as advanced. It is intolerable arrogance to discriminate between one human being and another because of skin colour. All human beings have the same heart, the same feelings, the same expression of love and hate. They all smile the same way. They all weep the same way. Many of the countries in which coloured people are born may seem primitive or backward, but no foreigner, no white man has the right to occupy their lands forcibly by using guns and cannons against unarmed natives. Imagine the brutality when black human beings were treated as slaves. Although slavery was abolished, the white colonial powers continued to inflict unspeakable insults and torture on the poor and simple people of their colonies. If the history of colonial rule in Africa, Asia and Latin America were written truthfully and objectively, the enormity of the crimes committed by white rulers would shock humankind. I have myself experienced some of this during the period of British rule in India. The British arrived in India without an entry pass or visa and stayed on for nearly 300 years. Now, when Indians travel to the United Kingdom with proper visas, their experience of questioning by the airport immigration officers is generally horrendous. I was holding a diplomatic passport, being the wife of a senior diplomat, and yet I was asked rude and insulting questions, all because I was an Indian, a non-white. Once they subjected me to a body search for no reason whatsoever. This was nothing but blatant racism. The white races seem to believe that they have a divine right to be rude and insulting to the inferior colored races. In America, the biggest social problem has been racism. The way the black people were treated by the authorities, as well as the common white people, was not only wrong, but absolutely sinful. Great souls like Abraham Lincoln were deeply distressed by this sinister attitude and tried their best to eradicate racism by instituting laws against slavery. But despite such laws being on the statute book, serious riots take place frequently between the whites and the blacks. This gangsterism has now permeated society, and people in many urban areas live in a state of constant terror. Those who have sown the seeds of racism are now themselves reaping a harvest of chaotic, brutal violence in which even teenagers are participating. Every action has a reaction. This reaction has reached its extreme all over the world in such an ugly and unjustifiable manner that it now seems impossible to reverse the relationship between the whites and coloured people. If the whites have any wisdom... They know that black people are superior to them in many areas. For example, people with white skin cannot sing like the blacks. 
They don't have the same natural gift of rhythm. I have seen, even when the blacks carry their dead to the cemetery, a band plays while all the mourners move in a rhythmic, dance-like way. One has to accept that most of the great singers are black people. Of course, some white people have been able to succeed, but they cannot beat the black western singers who are so melodious and beautifully rhythmic that they remind one of the cuckoo bird of India. The cuckoo is also very black compared to all other birds. With its melodious song, the cuckoo announces the arrival of spring in the garden. You cannot find birds having the absurd complex about colour that humans have. Birds of all colours live very happily with each other. The talent in sports, which the blacks have, cannot be easily surpassed. All the games which require vigour and agility are performed better by the black people than anybody else. In basketball and baseball, the blacks predominate, and because of their proficiency and indispensability, they are accepted by the whites as equals on their teams. Why should this non-racist attitude in sports not spread to society as a whole? To understand and appreciate black people, you only need to be subtle, to become humble, and to realize how much they are blessed with gifts from the divine. All over the world, people know that every mother feels the same kind of labor pains whether she is black, white, brown, or blue. It is a historical fact that this difference of color and colored people was created by the mental activity of the people of very great insensitivity. This mental activity has come from the whites, who think they are very wise. If we really watch without any mentally created complexities, it's very touching to see how a mother produces her child with tremendous love. Many mothers have had a very hard time with labor pain, but as soon as the child is born, normal mothers, whatever may be their skin color, are full of tremendous love and forget what they have gone through. It is not that the whites produce their children through their noses or through their mouths. It's the same style for all mothers. They conceive the same way. They deliver the same way. Unfortunately, the love a black family has for its own children is not evident in the white people. In particular, the love Indians have for their children is not matched anywhere among the white people anymore. Indians discipline their children, no doubt, but their love for children is great. It reminds you of God the Father who loves us, his children, with great care and with constant attention. I had a washerwoman on my staff of domestics in Delhi. This lady had nine children, and some of them had grown up and were helping her in her profession. Some of them were very small, and the last one was hardly about two years of age. This one could only crawl around in the house. It was no help to her. Instead, she had to spend much energy and time on him. In the West, any such mother would have been fed up. One day, this child fell into the liquid which was boiled for preparing starch for the clothes that were washed by this lady and her husband. I was not in Delhi at that time. When I returned and heard the tragic story of this lady, I called the washerwoman and she came all the way to see me. She was crying incessantly and she had become very thin in one month. Earlier she was a very healthy and happy woman. I made her sit down and caressed her and asked her not to cry any more because the child was already dead. A month had already passed, but she only cried and did not answer nor speak to me. This went on for six hours, but she could not stop crying. Amazingly, among all her children this son had been the darkest child. Her elder children were much fairer, but this one had been extremely dark. When I saw this lady crying so much for this child, I just felt that our primordial mother, who has created us, must be caring for and loving all her children with the same intensity, whether we are black, brown, white, or yellow. When I went to Colombia, I discovered that the Colombian people are already aware of the subtle system which is responsible for our ascent. They found this out through the many excavations of clay pots and clay figures which lay buried in the earth. It is very surprising how symbolically they expressed their awareness of such a system and the energy that gives us this connection with the divine. They cannot explain, 
how they came to acquire this subtle knowledge thousands of years back, though whites think they are primitive people. The condor bird is their emblem for shipping. When I asked why they had a condor as the emblem for shipping, they told me to my great amazement that their forefathers had talked about a god called Vishnu, who came to their land from Bharat, India, my country, and he came on a condor. When they told me this, I was really stunned. My husband also heard it, and he too was amazed that they were talking about our Indian god Vishnu, who, as we know in our mythology, travels on a condor. The one with whom we talked was not a very well-educated person, but he knew a lot about his country's philosophy and culture. I found these people extremely kind, gentle and cultured. The way they do things reminds one of a very cultured society long before the whites reached America. For example, when they give you water in a glass, they touch the right hand with the left hand, as we do in India, as a humble gesture to suggest that the glass of water is being given with both hands and not rudely with one hand. Among the Colombian people, I discovered many behaviour patterns which we regard as extremely important cultural gestures in India. They're very simple, innocent people. Because they have disappeared into the high mountains, their faces were more Mongolian and their gestures were beautiful without any artificial permutations and combinations. These are very pure and simple-hearted people who live in the higher mountains of Bolivia. Luckily, I've become very close to some of these people who came to see me in order to gain knowledge about the subtle system. In Los Angeles, some Aboriginal people were being harassed because they owned some land a long time ago and now wanted to get it back. I asked them, What is so special about this particular land? In any case, you've lost the whole of America. Why do you care so much for this particular land? They told me, This is our holy land, where sage, which is the holy plant, grows. We have known for a long time that this is our holy land, and on a particular date of each month we go there to pray. And from all over, Native Americans come there once a year to pray to God Almighty. This land was unfortunately grabbed by an Indian from India who belongs to a very money-oriented society. They told me, You are an Indian from such an ancient country, and you will understand our feelings better. Can you talk to this Indian and tell him that this is holy land, which should be just for the people who want to come and pray in thousands? I was rather surprised to hear of their belief that this countryman of mine must be a religious person, that he would give back the land in question and restore it to the original owners to whom this land was especially holy. Obviously, these people did not know that many Indians living abroad have become worshippers of money only. They have lost their ancient roots and culture. They have become uprooted. For example, in Italy, they do not even speak any Indian language among themselves. I knew this Indian would not give even an inch of that land at any cost, because he had purchased it from the American government. The story of the struggle of Aboriginal people in America is long and heartrending. They gather behind a big compound wall and pray, sitting there, thinking that this land which is so vibrant with divine blessings will act and listen to their prayers. I agree with them because I know the fact is that certain places are especially vibrant, and if they believe that a place is a vibrant place, it must be the truth, because they have no interest in all other lands which were stolen and looted by the white skin. They just wanted this particular land. I didn't know how to approach the American government about it, and how much they would understand, because they are busy looking after other countries' problems and wars. The aboriginals were all brown-coloured people. I saw from their beautiful, sensitive eyes the intense expression of their desire to get this land. I explained to them that I was in no position to get the land for them. So they said, You are a saint, and if you pray to God, we will surely get this land. I felt deeply moved by the simple desire of these beautiful people, which may not ever be heard by the ears covered with white skin. My heart wept for them. I very much desire that a day may come when they get their land and the divine vibrations of that land. They told me, 
There are so many instances of people in ancient times who have been cured by coming to this place and praying to God. When I met the aboriginals from America, I felt a tremendous love and respect for them. They came to see me in a very decent and dignified dress. Very simple-hearted and with angelic behaviour, they sat on the ground with their hands folded. They were very peaceful within. Only their ladies spoke. The desire for their right on that holy land was in no way materialistic. I saw tremendous faith in the divine in those people who had been made orphans on their own land. The way they were dedicated to this land was amazing. They were not asking for it to make an economic adventure or as some sort of a money-making proposition. It was just an inner feeling, as we have in India for the river Ganges. They felt this was the holy land, which they should visit every year, otherwise they would not consider themselves to be people devoted to God. I was pleased to hear their ideas about the divine. What they said was the absolute truth. Racism is accepted and is imbibed by people who think that they are superior to other human beings. By thinking in this way, they are just indulging in mental activity. With such ideas in their mind, there is no way of their understanding reality. Once a group of people believe that they are higher than others, whatever sinful acts they do get justified in their own minds. They never look back to see that what they are doing is morally absolutely wrong. This racism comes from complete ignorance of reality. For example, in Europe, if you wear long skirts down to your knees, they ask you a question and look down upon you. Are you Turkish? Only the Turkish people are supposed to have shame. But if you wear a skirt, which is only six inches long, it is regarded as very fashionable and sophisticated. Of course, with that attire you might get varicose veins, you might get chillblains, you might even get arthritis. In Africa the people are very deep and subtle. They knew about a star which revolves around Jupiter a long time ago through their astrological knowledge. In India, astrology is based on the moon and not based on the sun. Thousands of years ago, it was predicted that a particular star would visit our world at a particular time. The time and course of the eclipses of the sun were accurately predicted. The after-effects of such eclipses were also very clearly described. So many other things have been predicted and prophesied with absolute accuracy. It is amazing to see how well this compares with the work of Western astronomers who have set up all the modern sophisticated machinery to study celestial movement. The Western scientists never showed any interest in India's knowledge of astronomy. Now, of course, some false people have started a big market of Ayurvedic medicines, which may not do any good because the vibrations of these false people may ruin the health of many in Europe. Still, people are crazy about Ayurveda and play into the hands of these special marketing experts. I know of so many doctors of Ayurveda, the Vedyas, who charge nothing for their treatment. They have the cures, but they are never marketed abroad. In America, according to law, no alternative medicine could be practiced. Our Lord Jesus Christ would be arrested if he cured any American in America. Except for the medicine, the patient does not have to pay much to such learned Vedyas, who lead a very ascetic life. I met one in Haridwar, who was a very learned man in Sanskrit. To my amazement, I found out that he was a full-fledged allopathic doctor, but somehow he took to Indian medicine and started researching about the old methods of Ayurveda. He was a man of such understanding that only by feeling the pulse of a person he could diagnose and say what was wrong with that person. When the white people get sick and have no hope of recovery, only then do they start searching for new alternatives. Then they don't think about what skin the doctor has. I've seen in England that there are many Indian doctors. In America also there are many Indian doctors who are very famous and extremely capable. So it shows that the skin, whether it's brown or black or white, makes no difference to the knowledge acquired by a human being. 
The Western doctors take no responsibility for their patients on Saturdays and Sundays or on holidays. For them, holidays are holy days, which they must celebrate by boozing and getting drunk. But even now you can find Indian doctors dedicated to their work. Because of traditions of compassion, the Indian doctors are very conscientious about their medical duties. I have felt and understood the pain of the black people, the agony of those who have gone through such horrible experiences, only because they had black skin. This discrimination according to colour is so common everywhere that one fails to understand how human beings, even on an individual basis, are also so conscious of their colour and complexion. If anyone insults or makes fun of a person because he has black skin, it is a very big crime against God Almighty. It is God who has created this variety, and when people use this variety to create disparity and an atmosphere of superiority, they don't know that they commit a sin which cannot be forgiven by the divine. Nobody has the right to insult or look down upon another because of skin colour. As a result of this continual racial harassment, black people have become extremely violent. In contrast, Indians do not take to heart the racial insults which they suffer in the Western countries. They consider this to be part of the game if you are an immigrant. They normally form their own groups and keep out of touch with the whites who are known to Indians as Gwaras. If we are to safeguard the future of this world for our progeny, we have to really go all out to end this hatred between the whites and the blacks. I don't know what is being done at the United Nations level to cure this evil. One has to realise that the biggest problems facing humanity arise from the hatred generated by racism. Maybe one day the fundamentalists may be pacified and we may see the light of peace in their hearts. But this kind of cheap, superficial mental approach towards other human beings is very difficult to change. Once these whites are enlightened and are blessed by the light of the Spirit, they will know that all human beings are the creations of God Almighty and there is no need to hate anyone because God is truth and God is love. It is immoral to hate someone. In India we do not say to another person, I hate you. Speaking such words would be very unmannerly and unsocial, even immoral. In the Western societies, there is no objection to the use of any kind of language. Whether they are ambassadors, ministers, presidents or prime ministers, some of them use very low-level language without any consideration as to what is inauspicious. In everyday social life, people say to each other, I hate you, I hate you! In the beginning, all this was really shocking to my Indian rustic mind. Hatred because of the colour of skin is not only an evil in itself. It can also bloat a person's ego and lead him on to violent crime. I know of a secretary-general who was harassed and thrown out by some developed countries would use their cunning ways of finding faults in him. The allegations that were brought against him were so low that anybody could see that there was a plot behind the whole scheme to get him out. He was definitely a very large-hearted Muslim. He translated many Indian scriptures into other languages, and this definitely brought Indian wisdom to the notice of the whole world. Although he was a Muslim, he respected all the great books of literature and religion. One of the allegations was that his wife went to Belgium in the official car. I have learned that the ambassador of the secretary-general's country posted to Belgium died suddenly. The wife of the secretary-general had to rush from Paris to Brussels. As no plane was available at that time, and as the lady had to go without delay to console her friend, the late ambassador's wife, she took the office car for this journey in an emergency, and she informed the office accordingly. I don't know what was the objection, but they would have stooped down to the level of saying that she should have taken a taxi. Racism has brought slavery to many countries. So many people were carried from Africa and sold to people to serve as slaves. This slavery prospered greatly a century ago. They say that the Bermuda Triangle is a very dangerous area to navigate ships, and several ships have sunk there. 
It is said that in this area so many slaves who were brought to America committed suicide, and they are the ones who are haunting all the ships that pass through that area with their tortured spirits. It may not be true, but one thing is true. If you subject a person to extreme torture, such torture itself, in an abstract way, takes a very destructive form and is responsible for atrocities which would not normally occur. For example, I had to deal with some people in Europe, especially in England, who were possessed. These people were crazy about hot Indian food, which even we could not eat. In America, we found that people who followed transcendental meditation were, surprisingly, also very fond of Indian food, and they used to visit Indian restaurants at least once a week. Their language also had some Indian words. It was very amazing. I felt that those Indians who had been massacred by the white skins and the political and economic empires must have possessed these white people. Otherwise, it is difficult to explain why the white skins have taken such a liking for very spicy and extremely hot Indian food. I also noticed Indian mannerisms and their behavior. The other day, I was in Chicago, and the head of the Hare Krishna movement came to see me. It was a very cold day, and I was amazed that he was wearing a dhoti, which was very thin. A dhoti is a piece of cloth that we Indians use for covering our body below the waist. He was completely shaved and had one pigtail coming out of his shaved scalp. It was very cold, and while everybody was shivering, this person was wearing an Indian dhoti, which was not suitable even in India during winter. He told me that his guru had said that if you wear a dhoti it is much easier to get to heaven and that you must shave your head so that the angels will recognize you and take you to the heaven of Nirvana. I told him that in our country, 80% of the people live in hotter areas and wear dhotis. We've been wearing dhotis from ancient times. According to the Hare Krishna theory, all these people must have already achieved their Nirvana. Then I turned to the question of shaving the head to get salvation. The great poet Kabir has said about this, if by shaving your head you get Nirvana, then what about the lamb, which is shaved twice a year? Hearing my comments, the Hare Krishna leader got very angry with me. I said, why are you angry with me? I am your mother. I am just asking you not to wear this dhoti in such cold weather, because you will have problems with your legs. He said, I am angry because you are criticizing my guru. I said, I am not criticizing him, but I am just asking you a logical question. It is very surprising that these naive people are advised by their gurus to wear clothes which are suitable for the hot climate of India, but totally unsuitable for the cold climate in America. This gentleman was very intelligent. He had read the Gita very well, and we talked about the Gita. But I told him that in the Gita it is not written anywhere that you should wear a dhoti or shave your head. It is amazing that these Western people have suddenly taken to Indian dress. Is this a reaction to racism that people want to do something that is not done by normal white-skinned people? Or is this a symptom of anti-culture movements which spring up from time to time? One can easily see that people in the West are very confused because of the prevalence of hatred and lack of a peaceful existence. Anyone can fool them. An entrepreneur can start any fashion in Milan or Paris which has adopted religiously and changed every year as the fashion changes. In the beginning, I worked with seven hippies in England just to try to make them understand how to achieve their ascent. For four years I struggled with them. I found that they had developed a kind of culture of great aggression, great unrest. These people were all white-skinned, but the hatred for blacks still lingered, although they had revolted against the system which was regulated by strict Western norms. For example, in England you are supposed to wear a tailcoat when you attend the Queen's party. The Queen's party is a unique function, which is regarded as very prestigious, and people keep the invitation of the Queen as a precious souvenir for their progeny to see. I was amazed that for this party the guests were expected to wear a tailcoat. Thank God that when we went there we were all allowed to wear our national dress. As no one can afford to have these tailcoats stitched, 
except for very rich ambassadors, most of the people rent them from a shop known as Moss Brothers. Hundreds of these tailcoats are rented every year. Some of them fit the one who rents them. Others are usually too tight, or rather too loose. People who wear them have an antiquated or anxious appearance. The people whom I knew otherwise could not be recognised because their gait had changed. They were walking with either a funny tight gait or with a loose gait like Charlie Chaplin, and some were getting worried about the wear and tear of their worn-out dresses. Actually, this tailcoat was a sartorial trick to cover the back hump of one of the kings, perhaps in the 16th century. I could not understand how to control my laughter when I saw this kind of nonsense accepted even today. Thank God all nationalities were allowed to come in their national dress. I really enjoyed the way the people of Congo, Ethiopia and other African countries came in their dress, which I had never seen before and which really gave a very beautiful variety to the whole event. And those people who came in their national dress were extremely relaxed and enjoyed all the music, but those who were in those odd uniforms from Moss Bros were very self-conscious and it was impossible to talk to them in a normal way. Perhaps they thought that they were already lords of ancient times or were very nervous to talk to ladies. Another problem akin to racism is the class consciousness in many Western countries. Upper-class people in England are very conscious of their status. They do not mingle with the lower class. Surprisingly, the same is true of Germans. They also believe that they are the masters of the art of high-class living. Nothing less than ornate gold-trim Rosenthal or Kaiser crockery would do for them. The consciousness of higher classes cannot be understood easily, because you see that their children cannot even pass the easiest O-level examination, the secondary-level academic qualifying exam in the United Kingdom, even if they try for years together. The French, who think that they are the most sophisticated, are now learning that their culture has brought them nothing but disaster as far as diplomatic society is concerned. There are books and books written about drinking in French, except for a few very great writers like Émile Zola, Maupassant and Molière. It is difficult to find a French writer who has taken any notice of self-respect or of respect for women. Once upon a time, the French were regarded as the most sophisticated people among the diplomatic services. I don't know how people discovered that this sophistication was extremely superficial and non-functional. The French themselves now criticise their own culture, which, as we know, is very sex-oriented, shameless and alcoholic. I have heard that the French show not only nude women, but also nude men these days through their media. Of course, all French films have bathroom scenes without fail. The French men sometimes look upset about their skinny, pale bodies being shown naked on the video, cinema or television screen. In France there are many coloured people, mostly Muslims from the former French colonies. As a result of the torture they suffered in the past, they have become fundamentalists and are attacking French culture. This is the ultimate result of racism. In the same way, Hitler gathered his forces over a period of years when Germany was openly very immoral. He was the product of racism. The atrocities and cruelties in which he indulged, must have been justifiable to him. Otherwise, how could he go on with his devices to destroy human beings? He was worse than a devil, as many describe him, but one should know how people get lost in their own ideas of superiority. These ego-oriented people want to show that they are in charge of the whole world and think that they have every right to be cruel to other people, under some pretext or under some sort of justification. Hitler himself did not try to find any reason why he hated the Jews. There's no evidence in his own life to show that he was tortured or even harmed or hurt by any Jew living in Germany. He took full advantage of the German situation, which was very immoral. In those days, the people of Germany lived in a decadent, vulgar way. One can understand that the revolt in his heart was against the society where people used women for their pleasure. On the other hand, women were very willingly available to the best of men who had money. Jews were known to be very religious and moral, 
but also very greedy. They had a tendency to lend money on exorbitant terms and to pursue the borrowers all their lives, often causing distress. This is another type of cruelty, where the money that one accumulates in a society of decadence is spent extravagantly for the so-called pleasures of life. In a society where lust becomes the lifestyle of people, greedy people pop up like mushrooms to take full advantage of the weakness of others. As a result, people become very money-oriented without any consideration, love, or compassion. He decided to weave this theme of hatred in his mind and to develop it into an effective design by which he could destroy the Jews. He got hold of the young German generation. All such people play on the idealism of the young generation who have no sense of discretion. The youth of Germany did not understand the true nature of the ridiculous plans of Hitler for these highly ego-pampered people. It was very easy to mould the minds of young people who already had an obtuse angle in their brain to hate Jews. They never realised that violence begets violence. Instead of killing the Jews, why did Hitler not think of improving the society which was so decadent and immoral? Unfortunately, such ideas which are constructive can never come into the mind of a mega-ego-oriented person. Firstly, they think they are the ones to save the whole world or to save society or to save the people who are dependent on them. Such a mind can never see that this thinking is dangerous for their own country and for others. Hitler had no right whatsoever to kill in order to regain the morality of the society. It is said that he sought guidance from the Dalai Lama of Tibet, who was selected as the spiritual head in those days. The selection of these Dalai Lamas is very mysterious. These days, the Dalai Lama has a special technique of asking for money all over the world, all year around. Hitler supported the Catholic Church, which in return supported Hitler. According to Hitler, the Jews killed Christ 2,000 years ago, so he had to kill the Jews. Coincidentally, at this time most of the European nations were undergoing the pangs of recession, which gave them a kind of numbing indifference to what was happening in Germany through the efforts of Hitler. It took many years for Hitler to build up his movement through his ideas. It is very surprising how human beings take to hatred so much more easily than to love and understanding. He built up German boys through the propagation of strict discipline and morality. Firstly, they had to shave their heads. Even today, we have many skinheads in America and also in Europe. Perhaps the idea is that by shaving the head, a person tries to disfigure himself so that he becomes a moral symbol and then seems to attract people who are lost and destroyed, who suffer from lust and who indulge in immorality. This is very true about false Indian gurus. I met one fellow who was a smuggler and was arrested. When he came out of jail, he became an instant saint. He shaved his head and began to wear saffron-coloured clothes. In India, most of those who were seekers and who wanted to become saints used to shave their heads and go to the Himalayas, where they stood on one leg in their efforts to achieve nirvana. It seems that some people use their shaven head or hairstyle to distract or to attract the attention of the opposite sex when their purpose is immoral. Both men and women use their hair to be attractive to the opposite sex. You can see even today people spending so much of their money to go to the hairdressers just to look attractive through their hairstyle. One may say that there are two extremes of personalities. Those who indulge in all kinds of pleasures which are physical or mental, while the other deny them and become dry, hot-tempered and aggressive. A person who is dry and aggressive on the outside is not necessarily a moral person inside. In achieving this morality by shaving their heads, or by standing on their heads, or by doing all kinds of rituals and penances or tapasyas, people may be covering up their immoral activities, or using all this as a camouflage for their secret life of corruption and immorality. We have had so many false gurus who have tried these tricks on simple people of faith, 
and who were found to be very cruel and immoral. Now, to all the critics of Hitler, he looks like an idiotic, foolish and maniacal type of a person. Actually, if you listen to any ego-oriented person, or see him, you will definitely witness the idiocy of his talk or of his behaviour very clearly, if you are not ego-oriented yourself, of course. If you are an ego-oriented person, then you will protest against him by saying he is trying to assert his ego. An egoist can always find the ego of another person very easily. But if you are a person who is afraid and frightened of egoists, you will either accept his value system or accept the tyranny and subjugation of such a tyrant. An evolved soul witnesses the babbling of an idiot and may get into the enjoyment of the humour of this stupid drama. Hitler's ideas impressed none of these two types, but he captured the minds of a third kind, which was innocent, simple, raw, and absolutely immature. The young teenagers whom he groomed over the years. For these people, killing became a great natural enjoyment. In the olden days, people used to go into the forest to kill animals, especially tigers. As a result, the tiger became a man-eater. The lion attacked human beings, and this killing had to be accepted. Eating the flesh of animals when sufficient food was not available was quite justified. Yet most of the people who went into the forest for hunting did it just for the pleasure of killing. This horrible desire could lead to a very dangerous ending. A horrendous war in Germany broke out against the Jews who died in gas chambers because, according to Hitler, they were very greedy and cruel and had killed Christ. After gaining complete control of the young people by the Nazi movement, the only solution Hitler announced was to kill the Jews. One cannot see how these Germans became so blind. People like Hitler develop a special fire in their speeches. Whatever they say explodes in the minds of people who are already filled with hatred. Moreover, it is a very contagious disease. Once it starts to move, it progresses in such a prolific way that one cannot have time even to think. The speed with which the power of hatred spreads is very remarkable compared to the power of pure love. Further, the people who thought they had every right to occupy all the territories of the world under their own country's name believed that this was their duty to their country. To fly the flag of their country became a symbol of sacrifice for patriotic endeavours. Hitler also gave the very deep colour of patriotism to his devilish work. It is surprising how he was born specially in Germany, but he could get such a decadent society to work with and to influence the young people who were open to his tactics. All ego-oriented people develop their IQ very fast. They know how to work out their plans by dominating others, how to justify their behaviour, and how to propagate their own ego-oriented thoughts to the multitudes. Thus, their IQ develops tremendously like a monster, who cheats their innate intelligence. As one starts cheating oneself by self-justification, the person glows with a great fiery radiance of reddish colour due to the burning heat of his own ego. An example of this can be seen from the people who live in Dharamshala, India, as refugees from Tibet. They follow the Dalai Lama, who goes begging for them all over the world. Their faces are flushed, and they look extremely happy. Most ego-oriented people are mega-happy, but some of them, through their cheated intelligence, can devise a lifestyle which is hypercritical, showing that they are extremely unhappy. Most of them will read great tragedies or songs of separation, or enjoy some stories which would make anybody cry and weep. It seems as if they are melting their tears under the influence of alcohol. They show they are very miserable, and they are very fond of sad poetry. To give them the benefit of the doubt, one can say perhaps their ego swings them like a pendulum towards being miserable, or maybe their heart is weeping without understanding that they are crying due to emotional disturbance. Actually, they are the ones who make others cry and weep much more. They are the ones who plan misery for others. If they see a film in which a person is tortured and made miserable, 
They never identify themselves with the villain who causes all the trouble and pain. On the contrary, they begin to feel that their fate is the same as that of the victim of oppression in the film. They entertain the illusion that they are the sufferers and the most tortured people. In North India, many people enjoy guzzle music. Guzzles are Urdu poems which describe the feelings of heartbroken persons, their pangs of separation and the pain caused to them by hard-hearted women. Such music is enjoyed by people who are usually drunk and who live in their own make-believe or imaginary world. Human beings are a great mixture of subtle contradictions. Without these contradictions, if they were to know how cruel they are, they would not be able to continue living on this earth. As it is, they follow the same contradictory pattern all their lives, growing old without being conscious of what they are doing. In India, we had a king called Ashoka, who indulged in wars and killing people. But when he saw a river overflowing with the blood of the people who were killed in the war, he was shocked at himself and surprised at the way he had been going on with his destruction. As a result, he took to Buddhism and tried to spread this religion of compassion all over Eastern Asia. Such transformations are very rare, but they are historically accurate and give us hope for the future, hope that a day will come when all such horrible people who are mercilessly killing each other will get transformed into angels on a mass scale. Though violence was raging like a fire during Hitler's time, today the fire has subsided. We can see that this fire is not really extinguished fully, but is still burning under the ashes. Sometimes you see the effects of this so-called dead fire all over the world. How can we completely end this fiery nature of human beings individually or in the masses where it builds up in flames of destruction? Is it possible to end this kind of eruption all over the world? It would be possible if human beings could understand and know that there is a cosmic divine love which permeates the creation and which works through human beings through their evolutionary process. If their attention is enlightened by the Spirit, they will enjoy their compassion and the higher values of spiritual life. This is the eternal joy which surpasses all the pleasures of violence. It may not happen today, but the message of peace has started rolling among the masses all over the world. It cannot be consummated by peace foundations or peace awards. Those who run these institutions or receive these awards must introspect and see whether they have the requisite light within themselves. What is needed is the complete transformation of a person into a divine personality who knows forgiveness and finds solutions for the problems of others. When people see this transformation in thousands of seekers of truth, then in masses they will take to this last evolutionary breakthrough. They will follow the evolved souls who will inspire them and kill the Hitler in their minds. We do not know that basically our pure desire seeks to attain the higher awareness of blissful existence. The violence of killing is a big problem in many democratic countries. If the governments are lenient and democratic and the laws for the well-being of the people are based on individual freedom, then such democracy is populated by many individuals who have no idea of the responsibilities which are attached to the concept of freedom. All kinds of chaos exist in democratic countries and one starts wondering what sort of demonocracy it has become. By merely identifying it as some great symbol, one cannot solve the problem of this inner tendency toward violence. If we are worried about our future, if we are concerned that our innocent progeny are going to be fatally affected, then we must seek the right solution, the right path. There is an 11-year-old boy in America who is regarded as a great hero for killing people. He has killed several people at such a young age, this killing can also become very subtle in different ways. For example, in the Islamic countries, as in the northern part of India, you see very clearly the effects of this kind of ego-oriented superiority of men, 
where they think they have every right to dominate women and torture them. Especially in the north of India, the people are sometimes absolutely wild and extremely cruel to their women folk. They go on justifying their behaviour and divert their attention away from what they are doing to their own wives. The atmosphere is full of insecurity for married women. These men consider themselves to be superior beings who have the right to suppress the legitimate feelings and aspirations of their legally wedded wives, who are tolerant and have to suffer in silence their cruel life of torture and suppression. They may be men of very high qualifications, or may be in charge of national affairs. They lead a double life. In their public life, they try to demonstrate a very diplomatic understanding of the whole world, and in their private life, they torture their wives and have no regret. They kill all their aspirations. When they treat their wives with disdain, it has an adverse effect on their children, who then show no respect for the mother. The father has no time for the children, as he is very busy with his ego. He gets all the respect from his children, but the children become wild like the father, or worse than him. A good mother is the one who creates good citizens for society. There are so many laws in the West to protect the rights of women, but in so many developing countries there is no such protection. The situation is beyond redemption in individual cases, but in North India this is an accepted pattern of life. It is worse in Japan, but in recent years the position of women in Japan has improved very visibly. In America, however, the family culture has gone to the other extreme. There, women rule the men and make them crazy. In India, there have been many social workers of great integrity and character who have tried to emancipate the situation of women. But still, it is pathetic and pitiable that women who care for their self-respect, the name of their family, the welfare of their children and the name of their husbands are the greatest sufferers of these ego-oriented, cruel husbands. There are so many cases of inhuman brutality to women all over the world. I have known so many women who have told me how their husbands have been behaving like Hitlers in their lives, but they dare not talk about it openly, else they would be tortured much more every day. It is not killing in one shot, but gradual destruction of the human personality of a wife. The children of such families also take either to the mother or to the father. If they take to their father, they become agents for future world-dominating people. Thus a society gets filled with people who are dominating, not necessarily men, but also women, as in America. Obviously the better way for human beings is to have a very balanced society of husband and wife. This is only possible when we have leaders, politicians and bureaucrats who are in complete balance. It is only possible when all those in charge of public affairs ascend in their evolutionary process and respect each other. If there is the spirit in every person, which is the reflection of the Almighty, it can shine into the personality of an individual and it can change another personality with love and compassion. If an aggressor realises after his ascent that he was behaving like a brute, he will just give up and become a beautiful personality of divinity. The story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is the story of a man of split personality with two different attributes, the evil in the shape of Mr. Hyde and the good in the shape of Dr. Jekyll. Mr. Hyde dominates Dr. Jekyll, who gives up, and Mr. Hyde takes over completely. A person who has bad tendencies becomes worse, and in his old age he becomes ghastly. This transformation is easier in younger ages. Often older people become hard-boiled crooks, unwilling to be transformed. Such people abuse saints, calling them funny names. Evil people of this kind could be the head of a mafia, or the head of some global organisation, or even the head of a state. Such persons feel they are the modern saviours. They do not know they will also fall into the trap of polarity. We have a very good example in Valmiki, the great saint who wrote the epic tale the Ramayana. He was a dacoit 
a bandit or robber, and a very aggressive person. His profession was to loot all the travellers on a lonely road and to feed his family with that loot. One day he met Narada, a celestial being whom he had captured and whom he was about to kill. Narada asked him, Why do you commit such heinous acts? It is a sin to kill somebody like this for his money. Valmiki answered, I have no way of feeding my family which is very large and all are dependent on me. Narada asked, What will they do for you? Valmiki replied, Anything that I ask them. Narada said, Will they die for you? And Valmiki said, with great confidence, Of course, they will all be willing to die for me. Narada told him, You better pretend that you are dead, and I will prove it to you that nobody will die for you because they are all very selfish people. They want to live on your ill-gotten money. The Dacoit agreed, and Narada pretended that Valmiki the Dacoit was dead and carried his body to his family. To the grieving family members of Valmiki, Narada said, Anybody who is willing to die for him should come forward, and in exchange I can give life to this dead person, Valmiki, who was so concerned about you all. He killed and looted people, and thus he committed many sins just to fill your bellies. They all said their explanation why they could not agree to die at that juncture of time, and could not therefore accept Narada's proposal. Valmiki, who was lying, still pretending to be dead, heard all this, he got up from his pretended death, gave up his family, who he renounced, and took to a very pure spiritual life. If this could happen to one person, it could happen to thousands. Saint Valmiki actually possessed a very great soul lying dormant within. Unfortunately, in present times we have no Narada, nor do we have a Valmiki these days. But through the advent of Saj Yoga, this transformation has taken place in thousands. If it happens to even 1% of the population of the world, I am sure it will have a very big impact on other people who are oppressed, and then it will spread even to the people who are the oppressors. Ultimately, the oppressors will find that oppressing others is not a very joy-giving process. On the contrary, in modern times, it boomerangs as a result of the polarity law. The acquisitive instinct, the desire to possess many things, also leads so many human beings to violent crime. It is the possession of land, possession of property, possession of money, possession of human beings. Individuals, societies, states and nations fight among themselves because of this greed, this stupid idea of possession. It is said that when we come on this earth our hands are not open, they are closed like a fist. But when at the end of our lives we go from here, our hands are open. This might mean that you come to this earth with the idea of grabbing whatever is possible, but when you go, all that you may have grabbed is left here, and you have to go to the other world with an empty hand. I don't know how many will go to heaven, or to hell. There is hell, and there is heaven on this earth only. When a person tortures other persons and creates a hell for them, actually he falls into hell himself, as he becomes a person cursed by circumstances. If he understands that his situation is the result of his own doing, he can be saved on this earth. For example, a man who is a free person can allow all the birds to walk in and all the animals to graze on his property without thinking that he is thereby suffering a loss. But supposing he becomes extremely possessive of that land, he will construct a big compound wall to keep animals and other human beings out. Such a man may start becoming a very narrow-minded, selfish person. He may not even allow his own father, brother, sister, or his childhood friend to enter his property. Of course, he will hate all foreigners, even foreign children. This kind of selfishness can go to an extreme in an individual man or even in a nation. Then it becomes a national idea, sparking violence. Again, there is a big craze in all the Western countries that immigration should not be allowed to their countries and the former colonies which they possessed, dominated, ruled and looted. They are now trying to stick the label of immigrants on people who had to come as a result of their association. 
They were living for ages in those countries. Now they have become very holy, pure people. They cannot have any foreign blood on the clean clothes of their lives. I cannot understand why so many Indians want to settle in Western countries. There, it is a life of humiliation, a life of a very different culture where no one respects you, unless you are an official holding some high position or a lot of ill-gotten money. India, on the other hand, offers a far more congenial society. People in India are much more religious and respect Mother Earth and all creatures as a tradition. But still, there are so many Indians who are suffering as immigrants everywhere. Instead of enjoying a free life in India, they just get entangled in the web of money-making and also a feeling that they are superior to Indians living in India. Very few Indians are really rich in England or America. They are mostly indebted to the banks and have to pay heavy and crushing interest charges. Sometimes, interest rates rise to the point where mortgage ease cannot pay the high interest charges. The banks then close in and take over the mortgaged property. Indians in Italy speak only Italian and live in the same modern style of Italy. They have accepted the restless lifestyle of the Western people. It is a crisis for them if they cannot go for a holiday like all Italians. But I must say, in general, they have not taken to the very licentious life of the Western people. On the contrary, very traditional North Indians now living in Italy torture their wives and ill-treat them, just like their counterparts do in India. In Canada, there are many Gujaratis who have openly accepted that they are homosexuals. They form big processions to compete with other homosexuals of America. This was advertised by the media as a very great advancement of the Indian people in Canada. These immigrant Indians have no self-respect. They have brought great shame to other Indians. They have no sense of decency and prestige. When all these non-resident Indians come to India, they look down upon their parents and their countrymen because India does not have the same facilities of good bathrooms or clean roads and clean houses as they have abroad. Instead of dominating people with their false ideas, they should identify themselves with the Indian problems and try to help them by presenting the right example of cleanliness to their families who are still in India. For example, a man told me that India is full of corruption and also of great violence, especially in Punjab, so he does not want to go back to his native land. If everybody runs away from the problems of his country and escapes the responsibility of looking after his own country, he will surely have no respect in other countries. People talk of global peace but we have to understand that so far people have not developed any sense of global awareness. For most of them, it is nonsense. We have the United Nations, which talks of peace and global life, but one finds largely that it is just a job-oriented organisation, which has developed under the great principle of global oneness. <laughs>